Chicago. <laughs> How you guys doing? Hello, hello, hello. hello. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, be before we start, I have to tell you that I have a lot of good memories of Chicago, and I wrote a bunch of them down. I just because I want to just tell you guys this. I met Donnie Osmond at the Chicago SEMA office. That was Capitol Records office. That was a real highlight. I, I love the people at Rolling Stones Records in Norridge. I don't know if that store is even there anymore, but they were awesome. Valerie Malinowski and uh, Wally and all them. Yeah. Ryan Blockinger, Crow's Nest Records, another old buddy of mine. Scott White over at Polygram. I saw it throwing muses at Metro once, one of the best shows I ever saw. Delamitri at Double Door, Lounge Axe. Went through Chicago with tons of bands, including the Charms, who I met you guys through. And I love Chicago. Well, Chicago must love you. <laughs> yeah. Did you guys did you guys grow up there? I did. I uh, uh, life wise, I did. No, um, right. Uh, no, I uh, I grew up downstate more. You know, I started there, and then uh, over the years, played up here a lot. And then it got to a point uh, in one of my bands, the Elvis Brothers that we moved up here and we moved up here and we already knew a lot of people from playing up here for years and things so it was kind of like another home and uh so yeah i did not grow up here but... small town boy comes to the big city I know. so like southern illinois uh middle sort of mid mid uh peak and peoria area which is known as the heart of illinois it's kind of like where you know now the, whole... the, the spleen would be like macomb no <laughs> So uh, the Elvis Brothers is a good place to start since that's why you moved to Chicago. Um, how old were you then or when When was that? That was like the mid -90s. We moved up here and, uh, well, you know, we started and had, a, well, our original success throughout the 80s and record deals and MTV and all that. But um, by 90, 1990, it was time to uh, relocate and we moved up here in 1990 and uh, we're around for another four or five years, kind of built it up again. That's another whole long story that involves all of that. But uh, we did, you know, as music things go, it's like, and, and then the 90s, we kind of went back up again and then we called it quits. And then Chloe and I met. Oh, so you didn't, I was going to ask you when you and Chloe met, that well, wasn't during the Elvis Brothers? We met at the tail end. I would say. Yeah, of very the Elvis Brothers. The Elvis so, Brothers last that last year, six months. So I am that. a I'm a brother. No. Um, so yeah, I it was the tail end. So I saw I was able to sort you of saw be the in, last gig. Yeah, I did see the very last gig. Which I didn't know was our last gig at the time for the yeah. a New Year's Eve show. So and I hope I wasn't I hope I didn't ruin that gig because I was there and that's why it was the last gig. No. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. We had yeah. started a band. We had started a band together, and, yeah. and uh, you know, we weren't dating or anything at all. She, but she just, oh, I'm gonna come up because it was like in, in the yeah. theater. We yeah, yeah, like oh, I'll just come up and see you. And it was, it was in, in Rockford, up in Rockford, near Home of the Cheap Trick, big theater, yes. big theater, and uh, it was fun. Yeah, yeah, it was a good gig. It was a fun gig. Um, it, it was it, it was a pretty good gig to end on. Yeah. I have to say, <laughs> you know, was yeah, the was big fun. hello. I'm sorry, was the Big Hello the band that you started or was this before the Big Hello? Um, I had started Big Hello a few years before different lineups. One Including? I one I started when I was in Champaign already, originally, when we were based <clears throat> out of Champaign, the Elvis Brothers. And what? I was just going to say, including, which super impressed me, one of your members was Gary Green from... Um, Gentle Giant. From Gentle Giant, thank you. Really? Amazing, crazy, amazing prog band. Like, yeah, oh yeah, I know them. I love them <laughs> so much. Yeah, Literally legendary. Awesome. Yeah, and he lived in Illinois, and yeah, you guys crazy. became friends, and he was in the band. Yeah, and then the next lineup was with Chloe, and uh, which was the one most people know at yeah. this point, but... Uh, Sorry, no. I'm sorry I ruined your whole oh, streak. I know, I'm kidding. Thing. I know. You didn't say anything about the marriage. I know, right. <laughs> That's coming. <laughs> All right, let me just go back for a second here. Uh, Chloe, so you were born right in Chicago. Yes. And you went to high school there and everything? I mean... All six years. Yes. 
<laughs> no, I did. Yes. <laughs> did you go to school after high school? Just curious. You seem like you went, went to college. <laughs> I went to college. I I went. I have too much education for what I do. Um, yes, and I have a I have a bachelor's degree. I have a master's degree. So. There you go. That explains how you're friends with my good friend, Ellie V, who went to Vassar oh. because you smart kids always hang out together. So, yeah, well, I feel like Ellie and I, I feel like Ellie's this, I'm very creative and quirky, and I know so is Ellie, but I often would sort of glom onto super smart people like Ellie. So, I feel like Ellie and I were meant to be friends because I was the weirdo creative artsy kid and she was the weirdo creative artsy kid but with a super brain and very smart because she went to Vassar yeah. Um, so I, yeah I I figured that could I I knew that you I didn't know but I figured you were yeah. like had a master's degree I didn't know what master's it, degree it's but. just you know I mean I I I liked I if I could I would be a professional student and get more master's degrees and doctorates but you know I don't know where it would get I don't know where it would get me but I, I like education. Did, did you play in another band before the Big Hello? Yeah, I played in some other bands that weren't super significant in the scheme of things. Um, but mostly I was super, super into jazz as a kid and a young adult. And jazz. then I sort of discovered rock and roll. I was a sax player, still my best, really? instrument, still my sort of my favorite instrument. And um, so I spent like my, I had older brothers and sisters. So that's where I sort of learned about rock and roll. But, but just for me, I would listen to only jazz. Like I was great. You know, Charlie Parker was, and is still like my favorite musician nice. ever. Um, but then I kind of discovered rock and roll. And, and then I discovered people like, David Bowie, who was a sax player turned guitar player, PJ Harvey, who was a sax player turned guitar player. Um, and I was like, oh, you can kind of do things that, cause I got interested in rock music, um, even though I still love jazz and still always want that to be on my tombstone, jazz saxophonist or something. But, um, but anyway, so I guess I came from a different place and maybe that's why, I, I don't know, I think that helped form my rock, rock and rollness because I sort of come from, come to it from a different place. Maybe one, the way David Bowie came to it or the way PJ Harvey came to it. So, one more thing about sax. I just had Dana Cauley from Morphine on my show last oh. week. And uh, he has that same kind of jazz vibe going on with his style, but... He, I believe he told me he heard that the Rolling Stones used the sax player. And he was like, if they can do it, I can do it. Well, and, and that also, like, I was, like, I remember hearing, like, the motels. I mean, not, I'm sorry. Well, the motels, yes. The motels who had sax. And also, oh, my God. Um, it's very early here for us, even though it's, like, sort of late-ish. Um, Mars it's Williams. It's oh, the, wait, the, wait, the waitresses. The waitresses. Oh, yeah. And yeah. And then, and since, so with Mars Williams, who was their sax player, and we've since become good friends with Mars. He's a friend of ours. He lives here in town. And, and I, that blew my mind when I heard like saxophone in these, these sort of, you know, new wave rock groups. Um, yeah, they're, and also. So good that they uh, I know what boys like. Yeah, that uh, the sax is is, <laughs> is one of my all time favorite yeah. saxophone parts in the song, and it's also very sort of Andy McKay Roxy music that I learned since I had like Roxy. Siblings, yeah. I also like learned about like Roxy music and Andy McKay, who also played oboe, and I play all the woodwinds. I'm I'm not great at all the woodwinds, but you sort of have to learn when you're a jazz player the other winds and. You know, I'm just, you know, that stuff kind of blew my mind. And then like learning that David Bowie played sax on his stuff and it was him playing. So that kind of got me into the rock. And then I'm like, you know, I want to learn guitar too. So I just picked up a guitar and it sort of learned me. <laughs> so. Okay. So I got to tie this all together now. So Brad, were you, what were you listening to before you started playing drums? What was I listening to before? Yeah. Like, did, did you have drummers that influenced you? Is that how you got into music? Um. I think I just kind of inherited it from my uh, probably my mom's side of the family. Uh, they all could play instruments by ear, and 
She had like 10 brothers and sisters, grew up in a super tiny, small town back in the day, you know. I want to interject. They were kind of like, imagine, you know, like they weren't, they weren't Appalachian, but imagine like this, this sort of big extended Appalachian family playing all kinds, I mean, just <laughs> playing all kinds of like, you know, fiddles and banjos and Mandolin. guitars and mandolins, just like that many of them that they probably made themselves and not ever having a lesson. And they were just all like, experts you know and we all lived in a tree <laughs> no but i mean it, but it, imagine like that kind of thing right. that's what i sort of imagine yeah i mean and you guys just doing amazing some of them actually yeah. played like radio shows oh you, oh you know uncle louie used to play have a radio show back in the day you know in the 40s or something yeah. you know and uh so anyway i think i inherited that from because i always just was attracted to music and wanted to play something and i told my uh parents that when i was like nine or ten my brother, seven years older, he already had a, a guitar and he was doing stuff already. And so at nine or 10, I remember, I want something. I want a guitar or drums or so. Well, what? Are you? I don't know. I just want something. So they bought me like this kind of toy, kind of cheap old guitar and a super cheap, tiny, weird little drum set. And I actually like would practice it along with stuff. With it. So anyway, so it started early. So music wise, gosh, I don't know. You know, the first thing I ever played along to at that age, the, the Beatles were coming up. And, uh, but before that, the, I discovered they had these old 78s and stuff laying around. Yeah, yeah. Box trots and waltzes and mm -hmm. weird. And I used to put those on because, you know, at nine. And, and I would play along on little uh, cookie tins with like the longest pencils I could find. And <laughs> so it's weird. I would play along with these, that kind of thing. You know, those old box trots and weird, goofy things. But, you know, then I saw the Beatles. Uh, I uh, experienced that February 9th, 1964, like millions of other kids did. And I was like, yes, Master, I will follow you through the 60s, you know. And uh, so that was that the date of the Ed Sullivan show? What's that? Was that the date of the Ed Sullivan show that you just dropped? Uh, uh, February 9th, February yeah, 1964, which was uh, my mom's birthday. Wow. And uh, we have the television set that he watched <laughs> the Beatles on Ed Sullivan in our little sort of basement museum. Wow. It doesn't work, it doesn't anymore, work but it it's, looks really cool. It looks really cool. It, and there we go. How do you end up with that? Well, my parents got a new TV at some point and they gave that old TV, which was in great shape, you know, because everybody took care of stuff back then. Right. Gave it to my grandparents and they put it in their finished, <clears throat> excuse me, finished basement for their second TV. I don't ever even remember seeing it on down there. Maybe they probably watched it for a while, but over the years, it just stayed down there. So wow. they passed away, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, it was still sitting there and we're cleaning out the house. And I, go, and I realized, well, that's the TV I saw the Beatles on. I saw the whole, you know, Kennedy assassination stuff and everything through the sixties. And uh, so, uh, that's how I ended up with it. And uh, wow. people come downstairs like, can I take a picture of it? <laughs> did so you uh, did you like Ringo as a drummer? Is that why you became Absolutely more interested? Not. <laughs> that guy worst drummer in the business. No. No, I like yeah. No, I like Ringo a lot. Yeah. It was, it was all the all the 60s stuff. Oh, well, so it wasn't until uh so I was gonna be 10 that year. Just to be clear. He's totally joking about Ringo people. He yeah. loves Ringo. That, He's an amazing drummer. That, uh, I wish he'd play more drums I, now instead of sing. But. I was going to guess that Ringo's old buddy, Keith Moon, was his favorite drummer, but that would just be ah. a guess. Well, see, um, so I was going to be 10 that year, 1964, uh, in October, but this was February, February when I saw him. So the, by the next year, uh, I was 11, and I remember... I got to have a drum. I'm it, totally into this drum. So long story short, I got a drum and I practiced it. And I did that for a couple years, just on my own, playing along to all my favorite records, Beatles, Rolling Stones, and all that stuff. And then at some point, I took upon myself that teaching myself to play drums, and it just kind of fell naturally. I just kind of started playing. I didn't even think about it. I thought, oh, this way it always, this way it's supposed to be. If you want to play drums, you just play drums. And, and it uh, wasn't until years later, many years later, I realized people, a lot of people have to work at it, you know. 
It's just kind of weird, this natural thing that happened. So um, I thought, oh, I should follow somebody and uh, to learn from, you know, like find someone specific. And I just bought this single uh, by a band called The Who, and the song was called I Can See for Miles. And I think I really like that drummer, whoever that is. It's really <laughs> different. And God, he's got these some of the gunshots at certain points. And I think I like that drumming. And then it took me a while to figure out who the guy was and what his name was. And then so I was dead. Because there was no internet back then. So no, oh, no, there was. <laughs> I mean, it took me months and months going through like whatever few rock magazines there was back then. Finally, Keith Boone. That's a weird name. I wonder if that's his real name. But all this stuff. So I followed that. I was dedicated to following this drummer, Keith Boone, most of my, for 10, 12 years, you know. So that's where a lot of my stuff comes from. And and uh, and uh, then many years later, I discovered Gene Krupa. And I saw a clip of him. Wow, he's great. Man, I really love his drumming. And he's so flashy. He does all the stick stuff and twirls and all that, just like Keith Boone did. Yeah. And then I, like, Keith Moon was a big Gene Krupa fan. So it's weird that I was attracted to whatever mm -hmm. that that drumming style is in my DNA, you know. So so that's the story of that. Yeah, Ringo's favorite, John Bonham, Ginger Baker, Charlie Watts. Joe Morello. Joe Morello, you know, Hal Blaine. I didn't realize Hal Blaine was my favorite drummer until many years later. I always yeah. thought, oh, I like a... I like Mickey Dolan's. Oh, I, like, <laughs> I like Smitty from Paul Revere and the Raiders. Oh, I like uh, uh, Dennis Wilson from the Beach Boys. And I find out later it's how Blaine played on a lot of that stuff. He did it all. Um, so you guys met and then you had already had the big hello going. And then uh, Chloe joined in. You did like three records, I believe. The band was pretty popular. I mean, you guys, did you guys come close to getting a, a bigger, a big deal at that point? Yes, we did. Uh, by the way, I just want to say that we met on FarmersOnly.com. FarmersOnly.com. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, uh, <laughs> they didn't even have that back then. Oh, they I think if just... I've had a husband and wife team on my podcast before, and I can't remember if I have or not, but I'll maybe I'll think of one. But I okay. think you guys might be you the first. Have, what about Ellie and Joe? Duh. Yes, I have had them on my podcast. I don't know what you're talking about. Right? Yeah, or Steven Tyler and Joe Perry. Right. I forgot my best. I forgot my best friends. I know. Right, well, it's okay. We we make we tend to make people forget their best friends. Let's see, so. another, let's see another old couple, married couple. Oh yeah, Mick and Keith. Right there, you go. Um. So uh, I forgot the question. The big hello, almost <laughs> getting signed. Oh, yeah, I have a did. feeling I heard a story that you guys almost got signed or you yeah, did or something. We, did. we were signed for a week. We were signed for like a second, for two seconds, for 15 minutes. Oh, boy. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not, it's, you know, it's fine. It, we, we uh, there was like a new imprint starting under Sony. And um, the president of this imprint was like some, like a hot shot that I don't hot shot. I don't mean that in a, in a, in a bad way, in a derogatory way. He was, he, you know, who was running the label and um, he had discovered a lot of bands, he discovered, signed like, a lot of bands. He'd been around a while. Yeah. And, and they kind of drew him back into the, he had left the record business. They drew him back into the record business. You're not going to tell us who this was. Uh, I feel, should we say who it was? I mean, I don't want to like, well, I don't not, want to invade his privacy. Well, it's not like a, you would, no, he was a great guy. He was Dennis Wheeler. Yeah, his name was Dennis Wheeler, and he I was. I know that name. Yeah, he is great. He, I mean, and I don't blame him for wanting to leave the business because and it's. Uh, it's what, what was neat on his end of it that when we were talking to him, he goes, "Well, the story is, you know, I discovered this band and that band and all right. this stuff, and then he's like, and I just loved it, but then it just kind of turned into what I hate about music right. business." And I just didn't want to be one of those people when I left. And then know? and then when he came back, they promised him that it would sort of be the same way, that he could discover new bands and he wouldn't have to say, how many people can you draw and this and that? And they could do it their way. And um, and then our A&R person, which is amazingly cool, was Carlos Alomar, who they wow from who was David Bowie's band, leader, yeah. which, of course, brought it full circle a little bit back to me and also Brad, who was a Bowie fan. So um, Carlos Alomar was, was Bowie's band leader from 
trying to think of what era he started. You, you would know this more than I would. Around the Dogs era. Yeah. Yeah. Until, yeah. 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 I mean, an amazingly awesome guy. They were both like wonderful that. people. And it, and as or a young American somewhere. Yeah. I think, and as a woman in the music business, it was, it was nice to have men in the music business who weren't creepy. They were, they were <laughs> wonder. No, I mean, you know, you have to, you have to think about that. And, and like Ellie, you know, I can be a bit of a badass and I, I'm, I can hold my own, but you still want to be respected, you know? So, yeah. Um, so they were, they were wonderful, amazing people. They came to see us. They were always oh, we liked our performance. Uh, just, and... just treated us with the utmost respect as artists. And it wasn't like, you know, we're going to mold you into something else. It's like, we just want to have you branch out into your full potential. And then I don't know, a month or two later, the imprint lost all their funding <laughs> before so they did you actually anything. did you actually sign a contract? We didn't sign a contract. The contracts sign. were were like in transit to one another, but it was never we actually had we a were, phone call from a, a friend of Carlos and ours. Yeah. And he said on a Friday night said, Hey, congrats. On you the guys record are, deal. And we're like, right. huh? And you know, we'd been I talking. Mean, we had a lawyer we'd ready. Been talking and stuff, <laughs> you know. But, but we're like, what? He goes, Oh. Didn't he tell you? Yeah, yeah. I guess they decided they're going to sign you. The today. contracts like, are all oh, the way. Oh, maybe I wasn't yeah. supposed to say anything. Well, right. don't, don't tell him I told you. Well, right. I talked to you on Monday, and then like so all weekend we were like, Ooh, we were like, didn't want to yeah. tell anybody. Yeah. Right? And then you know we'll go through the weekend. Mm -hmm. and Monday didn't hear from him. Tuesday didn't hear from him. Wednesday maybe we should shoot him an email. So we did that. Didn't hear. We didn't hear for him. And usually when we would write, we'd get a response from him. So it was like a week. Then it like turned into like a week and a half. We hadn't heard from them. We we're like, oh man, what's going on? And then they finally got back. Yeah, and then us. we were, yeah. And then we, I mean, we talked to them a lot though. Cause we, after that, cause they're like, we're still going to try to save this thing. We're going to try to figure out what to do. And it just, it just fell through. They were in, and yeah. you know what? It, it was fine. Um, and that they said, that's why, if that's why we didn't call. We were scrambling. We're scrambling to, to try to thing, save you know? this and try to figure out if we could throw you on another, you know, so, um, you know, K Sara Sara, that that's what happens. And uh it was a strange time for me. Sarah Sarah. Uh-huh. She said, K Sarah Sarah. Say say <laughs> Sylvain Sylvain. Sylvain Sylvain. Right. Okay. So anyway, We're back. sorry, Duran Duran. <laughs> Duran Duran. All right. So um also Sylvain Sylvain, may he rest in peace. Adorable and one of my favorites. Duran Duran adorable and one of my favorites anyway um so for me it was a weird time anyway because I had uh I had had breast cancer and then the day we found the day that guy called us to say oh congratulations I had found out that I'd had a recurrence so oh. it was weird and I'm very open about this so that's why I talk about it and um we and I was I was a very young breast cancer patient and survivor so you know, it was a, it was a, it was odd because I was so young. So it was very surreal that whole time. I'm like, oh, I found out I had breast cancer again. And then I got, I'm getting this record deal. This is so weird. So, mm. I mean, it kind of, in some ways, I feel like not like having it fall through. I don't know, maybe was a good thing. I don't know if I would have had the same I don't know, survival or treatment or something. I don't know. It was That's weird. understandable. Yeah. And I mean, you know, we were, we were disappointed, but for some, some, we're all, Brad and I are always like the glass is half full. So we just persevere. And uh, I don't even remember, we weren't married then. Were we a couple <clears throat> at that point? I think we were. Okay. At that point, yeah. It's been so long. <laughs> it was kind of, it was pretty cool though. Cause you know, a Carlos Alomar and people were interested. Yeah. In us and, and we were excited. <clears throat> and uh, he would, when we would hang out and meet with him and he'd come in to see his play and stuff. You know, he'd go, well, what will happen is, right. You know, well, Tony, right. He Tony was... will produce. And we'll, I go, Tony, who Tony Visconti. Ooh. <laughs> I know, we're like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. So Tony, He's really good at this and that. So when he comes in, you know, we're like, what? You know, but. And then every once in a while, Carlos would go like, maybe I'll produce you, which, you know, we would be like, that would have been fine too. So it was just, it was very cute. Kind and of related. I met Earl Slick once. He came in my office for a meeting. 
when I was working at uh, this company called Third Stone Music. Um, and he was looking for, it was a deal we had with Atlantic. It was Michael Douglas is the actor's label. I worked for oh. him for a while and I got wow. a nice photo of Earl Slick and myself together. And we talked about Bowie and stuff. And I got to meet Bowie, but it was very briefly when he was in Tin Machine and this band I was working with the neighborhoods or on tour with them and in the oh, hallway. No. Hi. And I'm like, hi. And I like that. Name. I'll go home with you. No, you know, it was like, <laughs> it was like one of those like great things. I wanted to mention one other thing about Big Hello. Uh, today will be yesterday, tomorrow. I love that song and video. That was fantastic, by the way. That's what I remember about Big Hello, that song and that video, you know? Um, that is pretty cool because we actually are covering that song in the handcuffs. You are? Yeah. It's it's on it's the new album? On I'm sorry? It's on the new album? No, no. it's not. He, he No, it's oh. not. We, we're just, we've thrown it in our set at the request of, I think our, was it Emily who requested that? Or yeah, she was singing. Our bass player, yeah. And uh, we're like, oh yeah, she goes, she goes, oh, I like, I like that song. Let's. Oh, it's a great song. The video too. Yeah, really so good. it might be on the next record. We might like cover our own thing. It's been long enough now. Our and friend, why let a good song, you know, yeah, fade away, you know? Yeah, and we we sort of put a little a new handcuff spin on it. We've evolved cool. musically a little bit. I mean, it's a great song. It's a great song, but it's fun to do that song in a little different way. You guys um, have evolved as a band, and we're going to definitely talk about that because you. But I also want to mention, I'm glad the the video. Our friend Peter Kuehl, um from here in Chicago, he shot that video and edited it um, for a gazillion years ago, and and that also still holds up. So it does. It's still up there on YouTube because I revisited it. Yeah. Yeah, with an old uh, movie camera. Yeah, he shot it. Yep. So the big hello three records, how did it, I mean, did it come to an end where you just thought it was time for a change? And then what happened after that? Yeah. I mean, it sort of ran its course, I guess. And it was a great band with great people and great players, but Brad and I have always been, you know, there are some bands who will put out album after album after album and they sort of sound exactly the same. And that's fine for that band. And that's what they want to do. And that's what their fans expect. And Brad and I have always been evolvers, sort of, I am not comparing us to the Beatles at all, but sort of how the Beatles evolved. That's why I love the Beatles so much. Cause they started out as, you know, I want to hold your hand, you know, like, you know, the like the Ruddles, you know, and then they turned into this edgy, crazy, experimental, you know, for the time, Band. And so Brad and I have, have also always been like that. And actually the first time we met, we discussed evolution. So I think we just felt like it ran its course and that we sort of wanted to try different things, write a little differently. Um, and so it wasn't like anything bad happened, but we're like, well, this, it, this might be the time after the sort of record deal fell through. And then we sort of put out a best of again, with a few other extra tracks on it we we're like this might be the time to actually try something new and um and originally we were just going to have it be only a recording project um the handcuffs so you went right from the big hello right directly into yep. like the new project yeah right about the time the uh, comp of the first two with extra stuff uh mm -hmm. apples and oranges first first album apple album second album orange album and then so our compilation uh apples and oranges so it was apples and oranges so that was actually we'd already kind of started planning the handcuffs even though we didn't have a name yet yeah we started writing new stuff and we thought well we'll do this compilation thing it'll kind of hold us over for a while while we're doing this thing on the side so um, yeah and we were sort of wanting and we were trying to like definitively figure out how to make it a little different and how to evolve musically and sort of you know emotionally through the business and so the handcuffs we wanted to be came out of that and... yeah it, not even just edger just like do like different instrumentation slightly and we were listening to different things you know your tastes evolve over the years right too, you know and um yeah so we just sort of wanted to make it and we grew you know we grew up i'd been through a lot he'd been through a lot we both sort of had some life experiences that <laughs> we both had had some life experiences that were 
you know, very relevant and you grow from those things. And so, you know, it makes your creativity grow too. Is there any meaning at all behind the name the handcuffs or is that just a name that, cause I know names are hard to find. <laughs> I didn't plan um, on asking that question, but that I that was one of it is they are hard to find. Um we weren't living together at the time, even though we were married. I'm kidding. Yeah, um we, we were right, right, we weren't living together and he called me one day and said, Hey, I thought of a name. It was like at night, actually. It was at night, yeah, like probably at I woke you up. Eleven like, yeah, eleven. Okay. Yeah, I you I probably woke you up because I <laughs> I'm the late, but um he called me and he said, Hey, I thought of this great name. What about the handcuffs? And I was like, Oh, that's and, and amazing. We just, and we were just thinking just the two of us. Yeah. We we're thinking. So he was like, Oh, just we're handcuffed together. Um, you know, handcuffed two people. You'd be connected. Uh, and we're so connected in so many ways. Mu you know, we're re we were, we hit it off immediately talking about music when we first met over the phone. So we're like, we've sort of been handcuffed together that way, creatively, work ethic, all that it's stuff. Kind of a timeless name. And then yeah. like a rock and roll name. And then I'm like, the handcuffs is not going to be a folk band. No. And then I'm like online furiously, like, uh, you know, I'm on the phone, holding the phone back in the day I had, you know, and I'm like looking furiously it online phone, it was a pay phone <laughs> I had a little booth in my <laughs> 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 right. and then I brought my I mean I could hear someone going oh, are you gonna be and in I there? brought my giant IBM were they only a dime back then or did they did they I, go up to a quarter? a quarter no so I'm furiously looking online it's like, like does anybody phone. shut up does anybody <laughs> this is why so I'm furiously looking online to see, oh my God, somebody has to have that name. And nobody had the name. So we so we took the name, we trademarked it. Um, I don't know why we just did. Oh, I have lawyers in my family. They're like, trademark it, kid. Trademark it, kid. So uh so we so we we got the name and and then and then the other thing is then we got married and we, we trademarked that and the name for handcuffs. <laughs> Um, the name for spouse in Spanish is the same as the word for handcuffs, which I also thought was kind of cool. Um, we oh, love that. Boy. And I, I speak a little Spanish. I sort of double majored in Spanish um, as an undergrad. And so um, I also really liked that uh, concept. And so there you go. Wow. Spouses, handcuffs, handcuffed together. So it does have a meaning. I'm glad I just didn't have that in my notes and just decided to ask where the name came from after all that. Thank you. Or, um, or you could have fallen asleep during that story. So. <laughs> did you guys come out of the box really well? Because I know Electra Love was the second record, right? And that's yeah. the one that got a lot of attention. Did the first record come out of the box really well? Because I didn't know the band at that time. Um model for a revolution right Is that when we met yeah model for a revolution i'm trying to think of when that had like mickey 60 i mean that that it. record sold out i mean we don't have any more cds left. so it did come out of the box yeah, so yeah it got good we, stuff. i mean yeah. it's, a good album. it's a yeah no one had heard of it and peggy moffat the song peggy moffat's on there she's on the album cover she's a model from the which we because 60s. of that we ended up meeting her and got invited to <sighs> that's a great her, her home in Los Angeles. That's a ama an amazing story too. Uh, mm -hmm. And her husband, super famous photographer, the dearest, sweetest guy ever, um, who has since uh, left this mortal coil. Um, he had shot a million photos of a million people, actors, models, musicians. A lot of jazz. He shot like almost every Chet Baker photo you've ever seen. Trump really? Like, yeah, he and shot were, a lot of Steve McQueen. With, um, Steve McQueen. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of those cool classic shots. You know, right he now. and his wife Peggy spent you know sixty seven and sixty eight in London when nothing was going on in London then. You know, <laughs> so sarcasm. Yeah, sarcasm. So um, yeah, yeah, she was like in Blow Up. And, yeah. Uh, she was a bunch of she stuff. was the muse for Rudy Gernrich, who was a designer. Who we name check in that song. Um, also, uh, I'm sure she modeled for Mary Quant. They had the same haircut by Fidel Sassoon. Very cool people. Yeah, um, check out a but we we sixty six from that album. That was a, maybe the well. Oh. Forgive me, forgive me for saying this, or don't forgive me, but I thought the model on the second record wasn't bad either. So you had oh, two good you. models in a row. Um, you know and that's that a fantastic cover. So right, uh, that's funny. That's hilarious. He said 
Do, if in case the audience didn't catch that when you said you liked the model on the second record and he said and you and you were on there too chloe so <laughs> the guy drinking milk in the background of a wine glass well, yes, didn't you that, leave your hat it wasn't the hat sitting on on the on the side i was i was wondering why you weren't wearing the hat on the cover i wore the hat on the inside well because well, that was your hat i thought yeah, it was. i wore the hat on the inside oh you did you did sorry i forgot that that's all right but, no um yeah, that was sort of my empowering shot, having uh, been through a few, you know, pretty treacherous things with my health and body. So I was like, you know what? Why not? Yeah, I'm going to. It's gonna... a sexy uh, cover. It's a Very sexy nice. cover, but, but didn't I felt. Show any, didn't show anything. Was, oh, my God. It's, 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 it's her back. Right. You know, whatever. You know, when you think you, right. you get down to it, it's like, hey, oh, yeah, I guess you're right. And it was also a little bit of a tip of the hat to. The, even though it was the second album, we like to sort of have themes that go through. Um, it was a, a little bit of a tip of the hat to, because I'm also sort of topless on another photo, but you can't see anything. Um, the tip of the hat to Peggy Mop, Rudy Gernrich's uh, topless bikini, topless oh, right. bathing the, suit. The top of, yeah, he, he came up with That the was a very, suit. very famous photo where she's actually, you see everything. It's an amazingly beautiful photo just art and um so it was sort of a tip of the hat of that but I was not comfortable being a shy little rock and roller that but I am but what we've done is we've woken up all the boys and girls out there and they're all looking for the Thank electro God. love album yes. that album. it's also a good sounding album we actually it is that album the other day and um, can't, can't get the girl I before we started that I got a little confused about what record that was on oh, no but worries. that song was a huge hit for you guys yeah that was uh that well, that was on the first record, right? Can't get the girl, or was that the second album? I can't. I, I can't remember. It was the first album. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. See, I'm still confused. Yeah. I had it on a cassette, so we're, we're, we don't even know. <laughs> so oh, 14 years ago, right? <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I wanted to go through a little bit of history to work our way up to burn the rails because that's what we're here to talk about, you know. And it only took us 30 minutes to get to it, but oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I've checked out a couple of the songs. I cry for you, Lo uh, love while you can, cool video. How did you come up with the intro to that? By the way, I was wondering about the intro of "Love Me While You Can." Yeah. What do you mean? Just the well, then the video in the video it kind of starts really weird and then it kind of picks up. It's like a slower version, then it speeds up a little oh, bit. Just a quiet, uh, quiet intro, and then the band. It's like, ding, ding, ding. Oh, like wait, I'm just and playing then it's the, like, wait yeah. a minute. And she hit the distortion. Yeah. Okay. Louder. You know? Yeah. It's almost like someone's like playing the intro and someone goes, play it louder. Okay. Yeah, it goes acoustic to electric. I should have said that. That's yeah, I mean, not. it's actually not acoustic, but it's, but we may, but I, cause I'm playing it and I just suck on acoustic. So I played it on electric and, uh, it's, so it's just like a quiet to loud. And I don't know, we just, I don't even remember how that happened. Yeah, it's just, it just a, a good effect. Yeah. You know, like, well, it starts off with uh, Grapefruit, which is like a 30 second intro instrumental, which kind of has a vibe of the whole album, that little 30 seconds of what you're going to get, mm -hmm. drums and horns and everything. And then it ends and then it starts quietly. And then... <laughs> I guess I didn't correctly answer the question because I meant that whole thing with the thirty second part and then the oh, soft guitar mean, and then everything. You mean the, oh. you mean the great you mean the first song and then it goes into the yes opera. yeah it's ah. like a forty five seconds of of an intro great. that's what I meant I'm yeah. sorry I'm like, oh that's just Brad's like amazingly weird brain he white just, album ishy kind yeah. of like thing yeah it's like. And Weird that you, just super quick. That's the album that we when we first met on the phone a gazillion years ago. That's the album that we talked about for an hour. That was but we both loved that album so much. So it's interesting that you mentioned that. Well, Love my that. two favorite Beatles songs are on that album. While My Guitar Gently Weeps and Dear Prudence. I mean, those to me are the two. You know, I like I Am the Walrus and Strawberry Fields yeah. and a lot of other songs. But those two songs. We do a we we do an epic cover of While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Um, really? We, we play a George Harrison tribute like every year, and we own we kind of own that song for that tribute. Um, they know that not to give it to anybody else. So, and then we also played that song. We um, I'm digressing, but it's interesting. Cynthia Plastercaster, you you've heard oh, yeah. of 
So she was she a, passed away a few yeah, years ago. Dear friend of ours, dear, dear really, friend. yeah. And we, oh. um, yeah, we could do another podcast about a lot of things. So, so oh, Brad's Brad's gone. He's got to go. He's going to the grocery store. No. <laughs> uh, so we we did a there was a Cynthia Plaster Caster Memorial at Metro uh, last July on Ringo Starr's birthday, and um, we were the house band for that. Um, really, Chicago musicians and some other musicians came into town to you know, honor her uh, and, you know, play in her memory and sort of do a memorial for her, uh, the kind of funeral that we should all have, quite frankly, it was pretty amazing. So we were the house band. And then we also did some, some, some songs, you know, the handcuff songs. And then we played, people played like her favorite artists. Um, they would cover a song from some of her favorite bands. And so we did while my guitar gently weeps, uh, which, you know, we were all crying afterwards. The audience was all crying afterwards. Cause it was beautiful. Our guitar player, Jeff, just kills on the solo, um, makes it his own. So it was a really lovely, a lovely way to say goodbye to Cynthia. Um, um, everybody was amazing that night. The whole show was just beautiful. So yeah. Um, wow. Um, but it's funny you're saying all these things. It's like weird. You you're like kind of in tune with us. Like you're in sync with us. You well, know? I was out of tune on a couple of things I asked you, but you know, uh, trying to get back in tune. <laughs> um, the videos that you did, um, I guess Love While You Can was the one love I was me. thinking. Yeah, Love Me While You Can. Love yeah. Me While You Can. Yep. That's all right. Oh, all now right. that Brad's back, I have to say that you were talking about how you did While My Guitar Gently Pe Weeps and stuff. I I saw this Elvis Brothers thing, one, thing once, and you guys did a bunch of Zeppelin songs, like just guitar parts and drum parts of every like 10 different zeppelin songs in a row and i'm like how in the world could they have done that i was you you must remember that right uh yeah like 10 zeppelin intros <laughs> within like three minutes or something yeah exactly and um, by the way i had to leave i had i just bought five boxes of girl scout cookies Yay! Um, <laughs> they good for you to, they can now go to camp they can go to camp. <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, that just came. Elvis Brothers, we were always just had a blast on stage, and we they were just were, come up crazy stuff. And they were such a good band. I don't know why they weren't huge, but we have we still have a good following out there and everything. Yeah, and Facebook site and all that stuff. Anyway, uh, one <clears throat> one night uh, we ended something, and I started doing the intro to rock and roll, and then you know, then Rob joined in, and we, and then bam, bam, and then it just kind of stopped. And then he went We just started like doing intros to Zeppelin songs. It was good. And it just stuck. And then so night we got to a point where it was a bit, you yeah. know. So, well, all, so we didn't actually do Zeppelin <clears throat> songs. We didn't have to sing, you know. <laughs> right. We just did all the cool riffs to the intro riffs okay. to all these songs, you know, communication breakdown and and uh you know out on the tiles or whatever misty mountain hop and uh and uh, it was funny we would usually do it for like encores you know we'll throw it in for an encore people go nuts over it. and uh there's three of us and uh zeppelin had that song four sticks oh yeah album but we call so we called our medley three sticks there's, <laughs> there's three of us <laughs> so we were doing an encore song, and then right when it ended, we kind of look over, and every once in a while, we go, we just go. Yeah. That's cool. So anyway, that's the story of that fun bit. It's on YouTube. You can find a couple live versions. I saw it. I saw it. Um, I have to ask you about Morgan Fisher, Mott the Hoople, Mott, Ian Hunter, everything he did. Uh, in your bio, which I just glanced at this morning, it said that you wrote a review, Chloe? And yes. that's how Mar Morgan Fisher came so, on your radar? So I, we saw Mott the Hoople, they re they did like a reunion. Yeah, I missed it. Before. The most, I don't even know how to describe. Good, warm, warm just, rock and roll, old school. Uh, like, awesome. like they were all 25. Like it was, they were amazing. The, and the rant band, you know, was also the the backing band and they were all amazing. And I, it was also a really fun show. It was at the Chicago theater and every, I swear it was just musicians at the, I believe at the it. 
<laughs> it was so fun. It was like we were at like rock and roll camp with each other because we every, you know, you just you walk, you're into the you're in the theater and you walk in and you see everybody, you know, and all your friends Sitting are there behind you, right? All you. your musician oh, friends and just walking around like, you know, in the merch line, like, oh, my God, there's Kate. Oh, my God, there's, you know, there's uh, whatever who, you know, a lot of people that we knew were there. And so it was so that for one thing, it was really fun and great to share that with like, again, I swear it was all musicians, the whole music community, young and old, and everybody, drummers. right. <laughs> everybody <laughs> from like their twenties to their seventies were there. And, you know, we, it, it, this is a pretty close knit community here. So mm -hmm. it was great to see everybody. And some people that, you know, you didn't know very well, but you maybe knew on Facebook, like, Oh, Hey, I'm so-and-so I'm at your Facebook. Friend. Oh, it's so great to meet you in person. Hugs, hugs. So then after the show, which was, crazy amazing such a good show um i wrote a review just a fun review on facebook with a little profanity and stuff and and um then somebody saw that review from like a online magazine and said they actually wrote brad and so i saw your wife's review somewhere somebody shared it i'd like to know if i can publish it in my magazine i'll pay her and wow. so Brad's like, why didn't you just ask her? But so anyway, I wrote the guy and said, yeah, that'd be fine. And then I actually uh, made it a little bit longer and cleaned it up. So it wasn't so like, you know, fuck yeah. And so, oh, so, oh, am I allowed to swear on your podcast? Yeah, of course. Okay. I just, yeah, you are. Darn it. Darn it. <laughs> well, so, you know, I, I kind of, I still, I still kept it a little salty, like how I am, but I, I made it a little better. I was actually at one point a journalism major. So it was fun for me to write reviews and things and so and so so they published the review and then Morgan Fisher found it somehow I don't know somehow he he or somebody had sent it or somebody him. sent it him. Morgan actually Morgan's really good about he's he's very active online and very good about like looking for things so he posted the review like publicly mm -hmm. And said, like, this is the best. I mean, he literally said this. I'm sure since then they've had great reviews because I think we were just like the third, second or third show of the tour. Like, this is the best review I've seen yet of the show. It's amazing. I don't know who this woman is, but this is an amazing review. I love it. And then Morgan friended me on Facebook. And then, I mean, oh, the review literally went viral. Like well, that. Also, um, when I bought the Girl Scout cookies. No. Uh, also, um, <laughs> uh, in the review as a setup, and oh, Chloe is the writer, uh, oh. writer, and she's in the band as band oh, the right. handcuffs. And so he looked up the handcuffs yeah. and he said that he really liked the music. Wow, oh, he wrote his thing. That's great. Oh, he had a really good band. The oh, yeah, and, yes. So that's how he found yeah, it. Yeah, so, so then he actually promoted saying, Oh, this woman who's in this band, the handcuffs, and she they have a great band. So, yeah, so that's how we found each other. And, um, and I was just going on and on about like how great Morgan was and just everybody, everybody was amazing. And, um, and so well, that, one, that one guy, no, they're all, you are wrong, sir. And, um, and of course they have like a, you know, a sax player who also plays guitar. So I was like completely smitten with him. You know, it was just, so more, so we just became friends with Morgan. He's like the friendliest, loveliest. I'm ruining his rock and roll cred, but he is the, friendliest loveliest coolest guy ever and and he even said we were working on our record and he said if you ever need any extra keyboards or synth uh-oh and we were like <laughs> maybe we're such big mott fans so that's kind of how that came about and, and now we like zoom with he lives in japan wow we've never met him in person but we zoom with him all the time um we hope to one day also, you know, the pandemic happened not long after that. So, yeah, you know, okay. it wasn't like any of us could go anywhere or Wouldn't travel. That was like, I could be wrong with it. Like November and then. No, the, the show is in April. So it was the oh, following, was wow. the following wow. February. But, you know, we maybe were. Maybe I'm thinking of Thanksgiving. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I, I, you know, I have to take this opportunity now to tell a story about the leader of Mott the Hoople because it's one of my favorite stories ever. And I know you guys will appreciate it. The Charms, who you know, were doing these shows with uh, the Zombies and and Ian Hunter. 
And one of them was at the Wilton Theater in L.A., and I was there. And during the sound check, I decided I wanted to watch Ian Hunter's sound check. I went and sat in the middle of the theater. No one was there. And they played Irene Wilde. And I kept asking the band, are they doing Irene Wilde? And this? no, no, they haven't done. No, no. And I'm sitting there during the sound check and they're playing. He's playing Irene Wilde, my favorite song from All American Alien Boy. After the show, Ellie's like, you want to meet Ian Hunter? And I'm like, well, we met years ago, but it was really brief. And of course I want to meet him. So she took me in. He's sitting on a couch. I went and sat down with him. I told them, I, and they didn't play it during the show. I said, I go went to your sound check and you played Irene Wilde and you didn't do it in the show. And he goes, I don't know why we played it. I just had a funny feeling that we should play it. And I was like, just it just blew my mind. And then we just talked about Queen because he's friends with Brian May yep. and uh, uh, Roger Taylor. And I love Queen. They're like my favorite band ever. And he was the nicest guy ever. Ian Hunter. I, I love that story. I love when that stuff happens. Like, why did I play this song? And you're sitting there, the only one, and it's your favorite. I love that. I love that. It's an amazing story. I met Rod Argent that day, too. It was probably one of the best days of my life, except when I went met the Romantics. They were kind of cool, too, you know? Except when, or, or today. <laughs> today is the best day of your life. Before It's one of them. Uh, <laughs> you guys are really funny. Before I ask Brad another question about something else, I, I wanted to just talk about what you guys have planned for the future with uh, Burn the Rails. I think I read that you're, opening, you're playing a show with Electric Frankenstein, and I thought that was kind of uh, different. I mean, you know, because they're more of a punkier, heavier band. But you guys used to be more punkier. You've gotten a little more mainstreamish, I think, as the years Oh, see, I on. think it's opposite. Really? We've gotten edgier. Yeah. I mean, we actually play with a lot of punk bands. And I don't, and it might be, if you see our live show, I mean, we're pretty loud. We're not like- And they ask us. Yeah, they ask, they ask the punk- maybe they, maybe they want to kick our ass, I don't know. No, they ask us, and I don't know if it's because it we're we're like a rock, you know, we're a rock and roll band. And yeah. it might be that we're like the, sort of the sorbet in between courses, but we still rock. So that might be- And I, I didn't mean to imply that you didn't rock, by the no, way. No, 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 just... no. Yeah, I, I you know what I think it is. What it could be is it's kind of like, a, you know, the Clash and uh, and uh, of course, like Sex Pistols and all those bands. Their favorite punky bands were Mott the Hoople. Yeah. And uh, the glam bands. Yeah. 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 Kind of stuff, you know, uh, so they loved all that. Oh, we, you know, Mott, they were pretty edgy and punky back in the day. Yeah, they that's a good, good rock point. and roll. But, you know, Ian had that sarcastic humor, you know. He, uh, there's like one clip of them I know on uh, YouTube of them like on in concert or something and he goes it's so awesome it's so Ian Hunter and, he, and they're playing the song and, and he goes uh, oh, it's, you know, we're back here and you got a shade on we're back here in LA it's always great to be back here in LA actually it's not it's not really <laughs> that great you know it's just the heat and the clothes <laughs> So like, he, right. on live tv you know right. <laughs> rock and roll queen was kind of punky to me you know that's yeah, right. I mean, our, oh, oh go ahead i was gonna say that you said that um <clears throat> which was on their first album and then i think it was like their third album oh before, by the way they oh nice it's we all, we all have good t-shirts on oh so you know, nice you're going to have to watch the YouTube video, people out there listening. I agree. Got Max is Kansas City, Mata Hoopla, and Joan Jett. And we're Perfect. all well represented. Amazing. So the, the song, the album Brain Capers. <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mata Hoopla, the big red <laughs> cover. <clears throat> the song uh, Death May Be Your Santa Claus, which is a great title <laughs> in the first place. The best title ever. You know, in 1972 <laughs> yeah. or uh, three, that Death May Be Your Santa Claus. Uh -huh. And... Uh, there was this thread years ago, like on Facebook, someone posted something on that, and and there were people going, "Oh, you know, uh, Clash and all their, their their favorite album. They love that." And then someone wrote, which is kind of true. I never thought about. It. He goes, "Yeah, I think uh, about three or four Sex Pistols songs were written from the chords in that song." And if you listen yeah. to it, it is it goes, and it's like, "Yeah, I yeah. hear Sex Pistols the kind of stuff throughout that song, little bits and pieces, and." Uh, so uh, that might tie in with 
the punk thing and yeah. that's what we do because we're a good rock and roll band and we have you know some sarcasm in there you know like a our song uh, why don't you keep your big fat mouth shut and you know and things yeah. like that and uh, i forget what else uh yeah and i feel like yeah that like the electric frankenstein thing like they are so su we're super excited to play with them but they're super <laughs> excited to play with us too which we kind of love it's a it's a great club too this club we're playing is just uh Good rock and roll. Good you rock got, you, what do you what else you guys have planned? Um lunch. Yeah. Um <laughs> this is like the ruddles. You know? I know it's like <laughs> all you need is lunch. No, is that what it's called? A hard day's lunch? What is it? All, all you need a is hard, lunch. I like a hard day's lunch. Yeah, yellow <laughs> sandwich. Yellow. Anyway, um <laughs> You guys so, need to go on a comedy tour, I think. So, yeah, that'll that would last five minutes before the tomatoes started getting thrown at us. Um, as and bananas. As soon as we're done with this little this little podcast that you have, <laughs> as soon as we're, we're gonna be like fighting like cats and dogs, um, like cats. And so, um, what else we have planned? You mean live shows or just? Yeah, things? I mean, do you, I mean, is it? I mean, are you gonna go on the road? You think and do some we, out of town dates? We'd like to go on the road. So if there are any promoters out there who can support a tour for us. It's so expensive nowadays. Uh, pandemic, I'm not going to lie, killed killed everybody in our business. Yeah. Um, even my day job was, which is I'm a voice announcer. I do voiceover. Me. Right? It's putting up. It's just been, I mean, we're still kind of clawing, clawing our way back into the economy. So, um, but we would love to go on tour. So if anybody wants to help us go on tour, do it. Yeah, we we really want to. It's so expensive. We've yeah. had a lot of offers from other cities. Um, actually, Boston. Yeah, uh, I right. we would love to go out and play. Maybe you get the out. charms out of retirement. That uh, would be nice. A gazillion percent. There is no way I would do it unless they being play their play. former man, their you know their manager. Yeah. I mean, I would like to see them come back, but you know they decided to have a family and stuff, and I oh, love those kids. God, gross. <laughs> No, um, the cutest family <laughs> ever, by the way. Oh, my God. Like, their kids are just mini-me's of them. Yeah, those kids are going to have their own band soon. So, uh, Or they're going to they're gonna be, like, you know, uh, like, scientists at MIT or something. You know, <laughs> like, jo Josie whiz the jams to, like, uh, Zeppelin songs on the drums. She's wow. a good little drummer, that girl. Oh, my God. That's amazing. Well, the last time I was there with the Romantics, uh, oh, gosh, a couple years ago now, uh, they took me out and took me rounds and went out for dinner. It was great to hang with them. And, uh, yeah. Well, was... thank you for that segue, because before you leave, I have to ask you about your other band, uh, Brad. Um, I had Mike Skill on the show. I don't know if you caught that. That was, uh, I don't oh. know, must have been like about, it was a little while back. We had a nice talk. Wow. He's a good guy. Oh, yeah. And, uh, Dear friend. I, what is going on with the Romantics? I mean, are you guys still a band or well hold on before i have to say a disclaimer <laughs> you can't say too much because um, oh I, I wouldn't yeah okay we had we had okay there's um, a legal problem basically yeah and brad they sent one of the parties sent brad a cease and desist for things that he said well, i hope it wasn't Not mike no, it wasn't Mike. Oh, good. So no, Mike is a dear friend of ours. Oh, good, because I, I like Carol, Mike. There, no, um, it wasn't Mike. It's just there's a there's a sort of a. Go ahead. I'm just listening. No, I so just. So the band's not going to be doing any gigs soon, is what you're saying. Well, there's a version out there that not approved of, I guess, by what? the company or something, right? No, don't you can't say that. No, gosh, well, I don't know how to say it then. But, there's but a there's, version going out. There's, yeah. Without Mike and Brad. Yeah, put it that way. That's what I right. mean. Oh, that's sad to hear. I'm sorry I asked. We retract, or we, 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 Brad retracts what he said about not approved. We retract that. Retracted. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, one other little tiny question, Brad. Clem Burke, right? Is he yeah. the one that actually suggested you take over when he couldn't do the band anymore? Because I did hear that. Is that true? Yes. yes, he, um, you know, Blondie weren't, they had split up and and he did a number of things. He was drama Rama and, and I forget other projects he had, but he had also been playing drums with uh, Romantics for a number of years. Yeah. Uh, 
I won't even go into the other long story how it came about, but yeah, that's uh, another podcast. It was kind of interesting, but just the way fate is. But uh, I had talked to him on the phone, and he goes, "What are you doing?" I go, "Oh, we just got this new thing, this handcuffs thing. We're just doing no band yet." And anyway, I said, "And how's the Romantics doing?" Because they had just put out an album, sixty one forty nine, right? Really good review in Rolling Stone and all the stuff. He goes, "He goes, ah." He goes, oh, they just put it out, and um, Blondie's doing a reunion tour. And I go, oh, that's great. He goes, yeah, yeah, actually, I'm in, I'm in, Jer- I'm in Jersey right now. And I say, oh, that's cool. And uh, he goes, so I'm going to be gone for a year or two. And I, I go, oh, what are they going to do? He goes, I don't know. He goes, what are you doing? And I told him, I, we didn't even have a band at the moment. We are just writing songs and recording. And he goes, you should play for them. You'd be perfect for most stuff. And I say, well. So it is true. <laughs> Just it, you know. So he immediately called and said, You gotta get this guy, I'm not gonna be able to do it, but here's the guy you gotta get to take my place and be perfect. And and then I got a call like two days later and uh and twenty years later. And then I've been sitting in with him for twenty years. I saw a bunch of I saw a bunch of those shows. Obviously, you guys did a national tour with the charm, so I was at several of those shows and fantastic. It's great. I was I had to bring it up. This is really it's about the handcuffs, but you know, yeah, you I mean to- it's I, I will say that. You know, Brad and I, and we are very disappointed, but that's the music business that happens. Yeah. Um, we hope it gets resolved mm-hmm. somehow. Um, and on the other hand, we are my just, last gig with them was like weeks before COVID was announced. Oh, it's yeah. been a while. Okay. So I haven't played, they they well, haven't played and I haven't played in like three years. And then also before. he had to miss, then they played some shows uh, they played oh, three the three West Coast shows toward like in the fall of that year. When which, the vaccine first came out, I think it was the year later. It was actually no, it was that no, year. It was the end of okay, that so year. then end of that year, I and like, oh, finally I get to play. He had been vaccinated, and then uh, a week and a half before. about a week and a half before he was supposed to leave. We at all everybody in our band caught COVID. It was like, boom, 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 Brad was hospitalized. Really? Very oh, bad. Wow. Yeah. I mean, he's fine now, but it was super scary. Oh. Um, and so he couldn't play those romantic shows, and which finally some income and I get to play. Right. <laughs> then then people are like, How did you guys catch COVID? Right, we you were... guys are the most careful people right. when you vaccinated. I no. felt the same way when I got it after yeah. two shots and a booster and then I got it. I'm like, what in the world? It was like January yeah. last yeah. year. I mean, like... you know, the the shot what you know, obviously the vaccines help prevent you from dying from it, which is a good yeah. thing. So we, you know, thankfully he didn't die. Um, but if he hadn't have been That's vaccinated, different. we don't know what would have happened. So yeah. But it was not, you know, so he had to miss those shows. So, so I that was sad. <laughs> right. I had to call and tell him. I said, right. oh, I hate to tell you. Because we've been talking and setting stuff up. And I was just like, right. oh, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, the flights and this and that. And then I was like, uh, well, I can't do it. I just tested myself this morning and I'm positive for what? I go, I don't know, maybe you can get Clem to fill in. Right. And then the next day he was in the hospital. So, it, yeah. Wow. So, Boy, yeah. one simple question opened up a whole can of worms. Well, it's just so and so it is disappointing <laughs> that, you know, and Brad, I believe Brad helped elevate their sound and live performance a lot. And I think, you know, so it's so it's disappointing. And I just hope um everybody works it out and that it that it, you know, it it for the greater good. You know, I've been in the music business my whole yeah. life, so yeah. you know, I understand. There's always going to be some sort of problems that come up here and there, and they're unavoidable. We no, have a I'm lot glad of egos, you. I'm you know? really glad you did an interview with Mike because his also his solo record. Yeah, it's great. Fantastic. He is a good songwriter. That did you play record, on any of that, Brad? Most of it, yeah. Oh yeah, I thought so. I thought and I actually played, all played the, all on the two songs. I think or... I played on a couple things. I actually played bass on a song. Really? Shockingly. You wrote one. Oh, I wrote one of the songs. Duh. Yeah, Carrie got married. Carrie got married was my song. And oh, um, really? Wow. Yeah. And then I sang on that. I said I don't even remember the songs. I sang <laughs> some backgrounds on some songs. I played bass on one song, which is hilarious because Mike is also an amazing bass player. Yeah, I mean, he he's a great guitar player, but he's also one of my favorite bass players. Um, he does not play bass like a guitar player where it's noodly. He's so good and solid and creative. And, locks and so he's like, you play bass on the song. I'm like, 
really? Because I am like they were really monkey. encouraging about it. Yeah, it was just, so I did, and that was super fun. And I think I played sax on a song or two. Wow, and, that's uh, awesome. See, I, yeah. I knew you guys kind of got involved, but I didn't realize you did but that. Mostly much. his fantastic. His, his rec his songs are I mean, they are good. He's he, there. It's like, it was like, I was, it kind of blew me away how good that record. And also there was some evolution in those songs. You well, know, he did write most of the yeah, romantic he did. songs. Yeah. So. Yeah. So what there you go. What the heck I was new to it. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. He's been a songwriter for, you know, 85 years or whatever. Well, you know, thank you for spending some time talking about the romantics, too. I appreciate that. Sure. <laughs> and, you know, I wish you guys the very best with your new record. Oh, thanks. And, and I hope you I hope you do get out there and I hope you do come here. I'd love to see you. Well, we would love we would. I mean, that is really a priority. We're trying to figure out how to do that. Um, friends of ours own a tour bus company. So we're like, hmm. I'm doing some. Uh, East Coast oh, yeah. Brad will be out. In, Brad September. will be out in your area in September playing with. Uh, I forgot the name of the band. Split Squad. It's nice. Been, uh, Split Squad. Yeah. Do you know, have you ever heard of them? It's like a. I think. A, a guy from. A Flesh string, Tones. String. Oh. The guitar player, a String. What's his first name? Keith. 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 Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Guitar, somebody from Young Fresh Fellows. Me oh, nice. All Star Band. Michael Giblin. Uh, yeah. Giblin, uh, bass and lead vocal. Anyway, I just got asked to uh, do that, and uh, so we'll keep you posted. Um, yeah, it's around the Philadelphia area, Albany. Well, New York, Philadelphia. Yeah. yeah. All right. I think I feel like Steve is trying to like transition up to the end of this. <laughs> I feel like you should be my executive producer, Chloe. That's what I feel. Well, that was sort of what my <laughs> master's degree was sort of in. So. I, I'm happy to be your executive producer. And but I'm very expensive. I just want you to know. And we didn't, <laughs> we didn't even get to my first band, Screams. Oh my record, god. We need to do record. another podcast. He probably doesn't even know about you that. gotta listen to Screams. I think you would love this. I had an album in nineteen seventy-nine, uh, Screams yeah. on uh, Infinity, another short lived label. Which was M MCA. M MCA. Uh, Which is universal now. Four I think. month tour with Van Halen, played with Ramones. Uh, really? That the, David Bowie. Toured England, Early. headline toured England. We were on the Oakley Whistle Test. Yeah. Played the, our last show, at, uh, sold out at the Marquee, headlined. Wow. Screams so, with an S at the end? Yep, Screams. There's a Facebook site. Uh, it says Screams 1976 to 19. Well, Four years. You, you know I'm going to go look for it because that's my whole geeky way of life, knowing Love every it. obscure band I can know. So thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, this is on Pravda Records, a great label in Chicago. We love it. And I can't help but notice your artwork in the background. Yeah, your artwork's amazing. Did you, thank you. Did you do that? I did. Thank you. Wow. Really? Uh, when we get done, I'm going to get your address and I'm going to send you something. <gasps> Oh, that's amazing. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Steve. This was a blast. I could talk to you all day, even though you are like, I'm done. I'm My done. pleasure. My pleasure. All right. See Thank you guys. You. All right. Bye.